God's grace, mercy, and peace to you from Christ our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Sometimes these parables can become so familiar that they may lose their punch. So by God's grace, uh, may his spirit work among us as we meditate on the following text. Jesus said in our gospel lesson in the 18th and 19th verse, hear the parable of the sower. We've heard it many times, right? But as I prepared for this morning, it also reminded me of his words in John 12:24. Where he said, and you probably can't see this from where you are, but unless a seed falls into the ground and dies, and he was talking about himself, he said, it only remains a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Okay? The parable of the sower. Well, in our gospel lesson, Jesus went on to say, when anyone hears the word, and that's the key right there. Let's begin with a prayer. Lord God, We've heard words uh, throughout all of our life. Some of them we've understood and paid no attention to. Other times they sink in. Lord, may this parable and the words that you spoke through your son, Jesus Christ, and that we hear today, may they sink in and produce fruit. As we just sang, when Satan tries to steal that seed away and we don't even put up a fight, we pray that your spirit would remind us to hold on to that precious seed that it might bear fruit for your glory and your honor through Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, having lived in Nebraska now for probably a decade, and I went to school down at Concordia Seward growing up in Colorado, seeing the harvest here in Nebraska is pretty dramatic. And so as I think about the parable that Jesus presents for us in our gospel lesson this morning, it occurred to me, if anyone would understand this parable, I would think it would be the people of Nebraska. Amen? <laughs> all right. Well, maybe I should just sit down because you already know it all, right? Well, none of us get to that point where we know it all. Certainly not pastors and certainly not any of us. As I thought about the gospel t this morning, uh, Terry, could you put the, the sore up on the screen there? So I thought about this gospel lesson for this morning made me think our new license plates replace the golden rod sprig and the metal lark with our capitals soar I don't know if we've got it up there but you might have saw it as we began that big bronze sculpture on top of the capital if you look closely at the new license plates you can kind of see it in the background on all the new license plates maybe you've got one okay well, I bring that up because months ago when Governor Pete Ricketts unveiled this new design, he said that it incorporates a lot of things that are unique to Nebraska. The SOAR represents agriculture, and that's important in our state. And the design depicts, as you can see, an individual reaching into a pouch and sowing seed. We don't do that anymore. It's done in a much uh, more, maybe it's more efficient. Certainly it's, it's, it's higher technology with all the, the machines that I don't even begin to understand. Maybe you do. How they distribute all this seed in acres and acres and acres across all the farms in Nebraska. Well, thinking about the theme and our license plate, you probably know, I didn't know that until this week, that Nebraska state law requires that a new license plate be issued every six years. So my suggestion as we think about the gospel lesson for this morning is, as we look at this license plate and look a little closer and see that little sower on the car in front of us, may it remind us for the next six years to be open to God reminding us of this parable, a sower went out to sow. God obviously wasn't talking about seed corn. He was talking about the Word of God. But his intent was, as he did long ago, so today, his intent was that we would consider how similar the Word of God is to the seed that Nebraska farmers plant in their fields every single year. 
doesn't matter what the method is, whether it's scattering it that way or it's through machinery, modern machinery that does acres at a time. The point is what Jesus has to present to us this morning. Well, before we get to the, the, the lesson for this morning and think about the seed that God's planted in our heart, you know, I'm sure far better than me, that farmers spend a lot of hard-earned money on good seed. They don't just randomly pick any seed whatsoever. I didn't know that until this week where as our elders and our church council met, there was this pen on the table in the library there where we meet. And evidently there was somebody here who uh, was a distributor for curry seed corn and other kind of corn, soybean and whatever. And I went online to just kind of check it out. I thought there was just maybe one or two kinds of corn that a, a, a farmer would plant. That shows how ignorant I am of, of the subject. But it surprised me that just this one brand of corn alone has over 60 varieties of corn on which farmers have to choose, depending on what their ultimate goal is. Why well, bring me that up? Because as farmers plant corn, it isn't a willy-nilly operation that, that they're doing flying by the seat of their pants. And it isn't a willy-nilly thing that God does either as he plants one specific seed into our heart through Christ Jesus our Lord. And the seed that he intends to plant for us, obviously, is of far greater cost than the largest Nebraska farmer ever incurs. In fact, if we would, you know, accumulate all the, the farms in Nebraska and add up how much all the farmers spend on seed annually, it would be a drop in the bucket compared to the cost of the seed that God paid to make available to you and I free of charge. The Word of God made flesh through Christ Jesus died on a cross for our sins, rose from the grave, and sent His Holy Spirit to lead us into the kingdom of God in order to bring fruit to His glory. Obviously, there aren't 60 varieties or choices when it comes to the true Word of God, although the world would have us think that. They would have us think that all truth is equal and that there isn't one specific truth as God reveals who He is and who we are in the Scriptures. There is only one true Word of God. And obviously, there are not 60 ways into the kingdom of God, but only one. And that's through Jesus Christ alone. The Word made flesh. And it is this Word, or this seed, that our Heavenly Father wants to plant deeply into our hearts and into our lives to make it grow with the intent that it produce fruit. That's the bottom line of the gospel lesson. God's intent as he plants that saving faith into your heart is that it bear fruit so that others too might be saved. What a wondrous time we live in that God has cast this seed across the earth to all people in all nations at great expense to himself. I thought about this analogy for this morning. This is the best seed there is or ever will be. Unlike the seed corn that planters farm today, where there's, from what I understand, talking to some of our elders, there isn't a guarantee because there are so many variables. It's good corn, good seed, but there's really no guarantee. Unlike God's Word, where it is absolutely guaranteed to grow. No ifs, ands, or buts. The seed of God's Word will grow. That's what we got in the Old Testament lesson. He says it will accomplish what I intended it to do. But that doesn't mean there aren't risks or that there aren't dangers to young seedlings. I believe that's the point of the parable today. God's Word is perfect and pure. It is absolutely guaranteed to grow. But just like seed we plant in our gardens or the seed that farmers plant, there are pests and there are weeds that need to be dealt with. 
one way or another. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, weeds became part of life. You recall that God said to Adam, because you have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat, cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat it all the days of your life. And then he goes on to say, thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. We don't have to plant those. They come up automatically. We weed them out of our gardens. They come up again. They grow in the concrete. They grow everywhere. Thorns and thistles and weeds of every sort challenge good seed of every description. Well, this includes the best seed of all, God's Word. Farmers know this. What about us as Christians? Are we surprised when weeds crop up in our life? We shouldn't be. And if we are aware that weeds will grow up and they need to be attended to, what do we do? What are we doing to ensure that the seed of God's Word planted into our lives and in the lives of our children and our grandchildren and our nieces and nephew make it all the way to maturity and then the goal is to yield fruit that bears a hundred or sixty or thirty fold what was planted. Farmers don't pay three hundred dollars or more a bushel. I don't know what the current price is for it. Just to break even, right? That would be foolish. Their goal is naturally to have a harvest that brings them a profit. And God is looking for a harvest too. Jesus didn't die to be the only one to rise again and go to heaven. In our gospel lesson, Jesus points out there are only three things that keep a harvest from happening. And just like farmers in Nebraska, you and I have a fair amount of control over the things that work against God's word bringing fruit in our lives. It isn't just willy-nilly, I hope this doesn't happen. God gives us the ability and the foreknowledge to deal with all that would hamper the harvest of the kingdom. Jesus points them out in these three ways. He says, number one, what stops the harvest from growing is not understanding the word. And then he repeats that throughout the gospel lesson. Two, he says, the second thing that stops the harvest is roots that are prevented from growing deep into the eternal word of God. And the third thing, roots, the plants grow on, but the roots are choked out by weeds. Well, I asked our leaders this past Thursday as we gathered around the, the table in the library, have you ever re read or heard parts of God's word that you haven't understood? And just about everybody raised their hand. All of us have. That includes pastors. There are parts of God's Word that are hard to understand. And so we have one of two choices. We can let the evil one come and snatch the precious Word of God away and mistakenly think it's no big deal. Or we can hold on to it as the precious gift that it is and ask God, even though we don't understand it at the moment, to work within us the mighty power of his Holy Spirit so that in his time, his perfect time, our understanding is made fertile for that seed to grow. And it will grow. But it will take time. Farmers know that. The seed doesn't just sprout up overnight. And there are some parts of God's Word, as hard as they are to understand, may take a lifetime to understand. And that's okay. But cling on to it. Don't let Satan snatch it away because God wants to produce fruit in our life. Well, the second thing, Nebraska's farmers know that as seed is sown into the ground, root development... I'm not speaking as an authority here. I'm speaking on what I read on this website. Root development is 
not just important, but vital. And that makes sense, right? The roots got to be healthy and strong. Producers of seed know this too. And unlike our grandfathers and great-grandfathers, seed corn dealers have come up with this one thing that this website says is a seed treatment system where they coat the seeds. Now that, well, that's a pretty good idea. And they coat the seeds, apply to the seeds long before they're put into the ground to protect the seed from pests and disease that are going to happen. As I think about this root development in our state that every farmer knows about, as Christians, God mentions root development and it's important in our life too. He's aware that there are times when his seed goes forth and roots don't develop. It's good seed. It sprouts. But the roots aren't given a chance to develop. Jesus doesn't use the phrase, but it's, it's the essence of what he's saying, that there are spiritual pests, just like there are physical pests for farmers, in our life. And Jesus goes one step further and he identifies them for us so that they're, they don't take us by surprise. He de identifies them as tribulation and persecution. Well, we can hope that this never happens to us, but rather as a farmer in naivety would say, well, I hope there aren't any diseases or pests out there. He knows they're going to be. And so God is telling us as Christians, rather than naively hope that these never happen to us, it is far wiser to nurture the precious gift of faith that God has given us and, that, and allow the roots of his love and mercy to grow ever deeper into every single aspect of our life. That way, with a healthy root system connected deeply to the word of God and nurtured by other people who have made God's word a priority in their life, spiritual pests will not destroy our faith. This is God's spiritual treatment system to guarantee a harvest. And finally, Jesus points out roots that are choked out. It amazes me as I drive into our Nebraska countryside, mile after mile after mile, and look out into the fields. And you know what I see? You know what I don't see? I don't see one single weed out there. And it's no accident. If you planted a garden of vegetables, as I know some of you have done, or just planted flowers, as I know some of you have done, you know that weeds are a constant problem. So it is spiritually. Weeds are going to crop up in our life. Satan is out there sowing them all the time. The question is, what are we doing to keep the weeds out? What are we doing to uproot them from our spiritual life? Because if we don't, there will not be a harvest. Jesus describes them in two ways. He doesn't make it complicated. And in a way, they're two extremes of the same continuum. He very concisely says, the weeds that he's identified that hamper all Christians are the cares of the world, or the deceitfulness of riches. And how easy these spring up in our life. The cares of the world or the deceitfulness of riches. We can become either too concerned about the cares of the world or we can become too content with the life that God has given us on earth. And as a result, consequently, the kingdom of God is not a priority of our life because our number one focus is in the cares of the world or all the contentment, the riches that God's given us provide. Consequently, there's no fruit. Well, may the sower that we look at closely in the license plates ahead of us for the next six years Cause us to remember the seed that God has so lovingly planted into our lives at great expense to him. And by his grace, do everything by his mercy and in his power to nurture this seed 
in ourselves and in one another, in our congregation, in our church body, to bear abundant fruit for the glory of Christ Jesus.